Hello and welcome to the first webinar in the three webinar series on getting started with barcode based digital data collection for vegetable breeding programs by Michael Mazurik of Cornell University. These webinars will provide user friendly ways to set up your breeding or trial program with a barcode based system. This is your host, Alice Formiga, and I host webinars for two communities that are part of eExtension at extension.org, eOrganic and plant breeding and genomics. This is a plant breeding and genomics webinar, and you can find many other recorded webinars and articles on plant breeding in the webinar archive at the link on your screen, as well as on the plant breeding and genomics YouTube channel. The presentation will last about 45 minutes and then we'll have time for questions. We'll be reading as many questions out loud as we can after the presentation is over. Our presenter today, Michael Mazurik, is the Calvin Noyes Keeney Associate Professor in Plant Breeding and Genetics at Cornell University. His breeding program focuses on the improvement of vegetable crops for organic production systems, as well as identifying genes and developing tools to facilitate vegetable breeding progress. His program includes several vegetables, but has a focus on pest and disease resistance, in addition to flavor and convenience traits that promote the consumption of naturally nutritious foods. So Michael, we are very glad to have you on today and I'm going to hand over the screen controls to you and before I do I just remembered that I forgot to mention that there are two other webinars in the series that you probably saw when you signed up for this webinar and they are on September 7th and September 28th and they're going to get increasingly technical and uh, Michael will talk about those. So my, uh, Michael, now I'm going to hand over the screen control. Okay. Thank you, Alice, and thanks everybody for joining us. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the transition my program made uh, as we started to uh, move from clipboard uh, and note card based systems uh, to a much more uh, digital, uh, Muted. efficient data collection for us, uh, describing um, the, the journey we've made and some of the decisions we've made where it's hopefully useful to you as you are looking at um, uh, revising or getting started with using some of these uh, systems. And one of the key things that will be unique about what we present um, is there are uh, some programs and quite a bit going on now with some similar systems. You largely find them in the agronomic crops. And so we'll be looking at some of the specific things that are unique to uh, vegetable uh, crops or horticultural crops, things that have several harvests where you're looking at the qualities of each individual uh, fruit. Um, and and uh, a thank you uh, to uh, USDA NEFA for providing the funding for us to uh, put this together for you. So the, the motivation for us to move away from some of the handwritten systems uh, was that as we started to really scale up, as we got into genomic selection and started to do much more uh, larger plots, more plants, more analysis, um, we found ourselves uh, having many uh, transplants in the greenhouse, many stakes to have written and prepared. Um, the the writer's cramp from labeling all of those uh, and realized we needed an improved system there. And then as the plants went out into the field um, and we started to take more detailed observations of different uh, disease ratings, earliness, flowering times, uh, there's many routine observations we were making over and over on hundreds, uh, some of thousands of plots for uh, our butternut breeding program and knew there's a way to make them more efficient. Um, and then as we're making our selections or harvesting trialing plots, as we're bringing that into the greenhouse to cure, um, we would have many bags and counting, weighing fruit, inputting that, and things would become additionally complex when we tried to get more in-depth quality information from the fruit we were harvesting. And so as these fruit would come in that were cured, um, 
having a system here, we've improved it to be able to log in uh, the fruit as they're coming in with a scanner, um, weigh, slice, measure on this barcode ruler we're talking about, uh, and have ways to then have the labels transfer as we do bricks and dry matter readings. And the biggest challenge is getting that all to be compiled at the end. So how you can take all that information and consolidate it to something that is in a ready format to do uh, statistical analyses, make selections, um, and so forth. <clears throat> so goals and kind of what we set up and things to think about is you are working on one of these digital systems. Some of the big motivations, efficiency and accuracy. Um, as we were able to get away from uh, uh, transcription um, and just all the writing and the errors that come down with it, uh, where even as people are typing up data, you know, a decimal point or an extra digit uh, can be hard to deconvolute. Um, as we found more projects and different things to do in the lab that were complementing our field work um, and you know, the economics of plant breeding has changed, um, the ability to have the funded time in the winter to you know, type up all the data and analyze it was gone. And so as we have other projects, we just need to get it all done in the field. Um, we're looking at the security and availability of the data, um, the the all the horrors of having a page of the notes blow out of the window of the truck, uh, uh, having only one copy uh, to things that we now have these digital files uh, all on um, some box type software uh, where it's viewable by anyone on the team anywhere. If someone wants from home, they have access to it. It's not a, the written record. Uh, in a filing cabinet or in the other pickup truck um, that you want to add to. Um, it also allows us to, a uh, key thing is understanding the progress during the season. Um, by being able to look and assess the data as it comes in, uh, you're able to catch things real time, be able to look at ratings and the plants during the season and really put that all together uh, and be able to catch things before it's the winter and you wish you had another time to check that data point in the field, look to see if the plant really is that healthy or uh, has that much disease symptom or if someone uh, just uh, had a, an error as they entered the data. So our system um, and what we like about it, um, and there's probably other similar systems out there, but I wanted to share our system so people can see what we do and improve, modify it. And you know, we also welcome uh, input during the Q&A. There's other areas we'll mention in the upcoming webinars where we're still looking for some input and tips on how to do some things a little better. Um, so we wanted uh, something that could fit fresh market harvest crops where we have multiple multiple harvests and are tracing individual fruit. And we'll look at some of the reasons for that. Um, something that's really field appropriate, something where you can see the screen, uh, you can work in the sun and the rain, you still can uh, have use of your hands as you go through. Um, and some things that, you know, as accidents happen, some technology that will survive it. Um, we have uh, uh, right now very glad for the, the harvest crew that's just coming on temporarily. Um, so we wanted a system that anybody we brought on um, that would be able to quickly learn the, the, the system. Um, so it's based on simple spreadsheets, uh, everything that can be point and click. Uh, we're using off-the-shelf components, so um, things that have numerous sources and alternatives online, uh, and also uh, that we, uh, in general, they tend to have some really good tech support. So as we look at the scanners and the printers, uh, some of the software we get, you know, there's still places where you call in and someone will help you uh, with your challenge, and we found that very valuable. And you know, the goal for all of this is a digital input. So barcode IDs on the samples, making measurements by barcode, USB, Bluetooth, so things that are going directly into a spreadsheet, uh, hopefully with no keyboard uh, required, and we've essentially been able to eliminate that so it's all the exact measurements coming faithfully right into the system. So um, this is the first of three uh, webinars uh, Alice mentioned. So this first one is an overview.
you. Is going to be generally introducing you to some of the topics of barcodes um, and some, uh, an overview of the system we've created. And the next two are going to let you see some of the nitty gritty. And so if you're already familiar, familiar with barcodes, uh, you'll especially benefit from the webinars uh, two and three, where we're going to really show you our workflow, how we implement things, the products we use, and the choices we made and why they work well for us. There you go. Um, so um, first to start off is what is a barcode, right? And so that's key to much of what we do. Um, a barcode is really just the translation of text into a machine readable code. Um, one of the most common uh, we've had around for uh, quite a while, you're familiar with them on UPC codes, are these one dimensional barcodes. Um, we like those because they're quite robust in the field. Uh, is they're red, is it one dimensional? So they'll just have uh, a single line being read horizontally through um, the barcode. Um, this red line here is where the laser's reading it, measuring the pattern of uh, the, the width, the pattern of black to white space across here. And it's really robust in the field because as things happen, as they get mud spattered, damaged, uh, you can scan up or down the barcode and wherever the laser is able to hit a, a slice of that that's informative, um, it will be able to read and register value. Um, it's character limited though. And so you see this is the word hello is the human readable part to the machine readable text uh, code above. Um, they're useful because they can substitute for a ruler and they're compatible with all scanners. The alternative uh, is a two-dimensional barcode. So they have that below. Uh, so a two-dimensional barcode uh, you've seen increasingly in places like the QR codes where you can scan something to see the website. Um, they are much more information dense. Uh, so uh, the two-dimensional barcode I have here, for example, instead of just saying hello, we have a uh, more a couple of sentences of a greeting that's all encoded in there. So when you scan this, this is what the scanner is capturing uh, text wise. Um, they are less robust in the field. Um, we have learned um, and you know, some mud spatters um, and you know scratches damage a bird perching on your stake um, can definitely um, make it so it's hard to read as you're reading the whole thing uh, and you do need a two-dimensional reader they're great for seed packets keeping them indoors for us but in the field the one dimensional is the way to go and we are looking forward to some of the rfid tags that are more uh, proximity dependent so we don't even have to be scanning them um, so the barcodes, where we use those, uh, sample ID, uh, stickers and tags uh, we're putting on all the crates, you know, just like whatever package delivery comes to your doorstep, uh, they scan it in, it's a way to track where everything is. Um, and as we're tracking them in, as you have all these samples that you need to combine later in a spreadsheet, everything is faithfully produced with these unique identifiers. So you can uh, trace even individual fruit through the system and there's no typos that prevent the computer from combining that. Um, uh, routine responses we want to input. So as I mentioned, going through the field and listing off if the powdery mildew ratings or observations about plant architecture, anything you're writing frequently, you can make a barcode sticker and put that on your clipboard instead of writing on it. And you're just simply scanning uh, each of these responses. They're automatically going into your favorite spreadsheet software and measuring with the stacked barcode ruler uh, we included uh, in one of the handouts for the webinar. Right. So for unique identifiers, this is important because you're going to be translating uh, how you identify um, in, uh, plots, genotypes, plants, fruit um, in your planting plan and translating that to a barcode um, that can be read to track is you're going to hopefully keep through years. I'm using the system uh, that I have inherited from Henry Munger and Molly John and uh, 
So for several decades and tra translating that to this modern system. Uh, if you're using 1D barcodes, keeping it brief is critical. Uh, and also for us, you'll see we're using some unique characters that delimit the levels. And so we have some characters like a hyphen, an underscore, a decimal, never an asterisk. Uh, one thing that uh, plant breeders will often do is use an asterisk to uh, make a star uh, by the plants they like a lot. Um, the challenge is an asterisk is a wild card character uh, on the computer. And so once you start adding asterisks to your files, you can only remove them if you go by hand manually. Um, so look at two of the systems we use that are quite similar, breeding and trials, and how we set up these naming systems. And so very quickly thinking about what we're going to put on the stake first, um, we'll have an example for our breeding program. So here it's out of an F2 population maybe, where we'll have um, the 17-812 underscore 43.4. Uh, so in the system, the 17 indicates it's 2017, um, and 812 lets me know it's plot 812. And so that's what we would put field stakes for every plot, is you'd have that number. Then as you harvest from individual plants, uh, the 43.4 is the plant and the fruit, and that is going to let you trace, uh, uh, develop this code as you go through. So the 43 would also be on the bag and fruit four would be as you analyze individual fruit. And if you're saving seed, um, this four would go end up on the actual seed packet of maybe some seed you're harvesting from this plant out of this plot in 2017. The trials is really similar, so quickly a simple replicated trial. Uh, the 17-643t underscore c.4. Um, this whole code is again 2017 uh, as 643t. So we have the t for the trial. Uh, if you have multiple locations, you can vary that letter to help you sort them. Uh, the underscore um, a rep C, this might be what is on your field stake. And as you harvest fruit from that, um, and you start to look at the dimensional data, quality data, that's where each fruit is going to get a specific number. Uh, so the reason for that, and we do it in our trials, is with a lot of horticultural crops, plants that are harvested over a window of time, uh, you'll have variable ripeness uh, within that and maybe some other characteristics that affect individual fruit performance. Um, also, if you're just looking at some morphometric data and want to compare length, width, et cetera, um, through a plot. Now here is a sample of some honey nut squash uh, we harvested and looking through the plot you can see definitely ones that are smaller, larger, some that are still green and unripe. And so one of the things we can do is with keeping the data separate for each fruit to if some unripe fruit can get in the analysis to be able to remove all the data for that unripe fruit. And so keeping track of the individual fruits as it comes into the system, spreadsheet is very useful. So as you get going, uh, what does it actually take a cost to get started and if you wanted to you know, budget one of these uh, in an upcoming grant? Um, so your shopping list, uh, the first thing is having some barcode printing software. Uh, much of the software uh, is going to cost about $500. Um, what this software does is it translates your spreadsheets, all your planting plan, anything you want to print on a tag or a label into a barcode. Um, also, what it does is it will design the printout that's going to appear on the stakes or labels. So here I have an example from the software we use both where all of these are different text boxes you're pulling from different columns in a spreadsheet and what it's really nice is that it's just like any presentation software you've used so it's really easy um, and if you have ever had to do any uh, uh, snail mail mailing lists uh, and uh, stuff envelopes and print out uh, uh, these um, address labels uh, any of the challenges you've had in doing that 
this software also works and just makes all that process automated, easy to uh, uh, train other people, uh, students coming on for the summer how to do this. Um, there are also some free online barcode generators, many websites that do this. There's some fonts, some true type fonts you can download for Excel that will uh, put everything into a different barcode format that also is easily readable. Um, but they're a little less user friendly, uh, take a little bit more input and less automated and often lack some of the layout things so we couldn't do something like I did in the the tag below where we have the year and the plot and the barcode and the name all uh, all those fields coming together um, <clears throat> the next thing on a shopping list is the printer um, this can be really variable there are printers that are definitely much more uh, sophisticated much more durable more industrial than the ones we use um, and the two I have in the photo below uh, one is our label printer um, that we use for most things now and that's uh, those are often cost around $600 uh, the price is variable based on the model and what you pick uh, and our stake printer below um, that is the most expensive part of this around thirty three hundred dollars uh, with this printer uh, the more expensive larger printer you can change it from stakes to labels and back and forth and it can be uh, a one do it all machine but we found having some dedicated machines make it nice so it's ready for someone to just kind of sit down and go uh, in this uh, these printers are often uh, are going to use ribbons and actually transfer a wax or resin onto your labels or stakes and thermal transfer is the thing to look for uh, you'll also see printers that are direct thermal so these would be some of the printers that you might be familiar with and retailers to do receipts uh, these are also unfortunately the same receipts that if you leave in the windshield or they get hot they turn black they're using uh, temperature to uh, uh, change the color of the paper uh, which obviously doesn't work for uh, outdoor plant breeding applications and dry matter samples going in the dryer oven so a thermal transfer printer is what you're looking for um, if you're looking for the the printers, the label tags, um, those are all be referred to as you search as horticultural printers. Uh, we'll be showing you some of the ones that we've used in the considerations on the upcoming webinars. Uh, and if you are not going to go this route with these printers, um, there are uh, also some water resistant uh, sticker labels you can get that you can probably run through the, the local laser printer. It's just not as efficient as these that can be printed on the fly as you need them. Um, there are some consumables, the stakes and ribbon or the labels um, cost about one to three cents each and the, the ribbons are much less. Uh, and the, the sticker labels. The scanners, uh, again, there's a range. Uh, some of the things to consider, and we have different ones for indoor or outdoor, uh, whether you have Bluetooth or USB connectivity, uh, we tend to use USB scanners <clears throat> if we have it connected to our desktop printers in the lab, um, or there are also um, Bluetooth ones we take out to the field where that cord is just much more in the way. Uh, you can get uh, the 1D laser uh, uh, models. Uh, these work with 1D barcodes and 1D barcodes only. So that horizontal one I showed, it lets you use it as a ruler out in the field to scan that barcode. Um, but they are a little bit more tricky uh, to use. You have to get it lined up right. Um, so generally we've switched over to ones that are these 2D imager types. Uh, and so they're a fast camera that's quickly converting the image into text. Um, and you know, much it's much easier, faster to get a uh, get it read without having to worry about lining it up. Um, the other thing that these can do is they can read off screens, and so as you are looking at some of the barcodes you might include in some photos of plots, and you go to label those files, you can actually be reading the barcode uh, and labeling the file right from the screen itself, right from the image itself. Um, and so the ability to read off a computer screen is also very handy. 
Um, there's some different formats. Um, here on the right is the all-in-one PDA type model I use. If you've uh, been in a, a big store and been asking if something's in stock, probably someone had a model close to this in their pocket uh, to be able to check the stock for you, scan the barcode on the item you're interested in. Um, we find these are our favorite way to go. There's a hand strap on the back, uh, so it's almost wearable. It runs uh, standard uh, the PDA versions of Microsoft Excel. Um, and so there's a lot of things that transfer really well uh, from here to our computer. It has all the functionality of a computer with without uh, having any of the distractions from the tablets might have, so it doesn't do you know, no Instagram or Twitter in the field, but it does all the, the work type functions. Um, these are uh, much more expensive. Um, they're about $1,500 each. Um, there are you know, a range in prices there. <clears throat> it's also uh, for economy's sake, you can get uh, other models as cheap as $150 that are going to connect to a tablet. And so some Bluetooth readers that as you scan, it will just transfer to your tablet. The only uh, challenge is that you have two devices instead of one that's you know, stuck to your hand um, and quite, quite ergonomic and thought out. So what this means as you get going, uh, bare bones, laser, laser labels that code 39 true type font, uh, so you can print out everything uh, in the, the office and take it out, and the little barcode scanner. You're, it's looking at about you know, $200 plus consumables so that you're able to have all your plots labeled in the field and all your routine observations. Um, at the end of the hot day in the field, when you uh, get back uh, to the, the field house or home, all your data is entered, typed up, saved, backed up, and really secure, and that's all taken care of. Um, the setup we use um, is something we've gravitated to that has all of the, the pieces I was showing. Um, is about $4,500 uh, plus $1,500 per PDA uh, or one of those uh, handheld computers we're taking into the field. Um, so it is uh, uh, expensive, but it's something that has saved us at least that much time labor uh, in the field uh, and we have much better data much more quickly and easily. Um, I uh, will also uh, share that some of these PDAs um, uh, we'll be focusing on in the upcoming webinar, you can also get for about $500 used. Um, so um, I might have trouble finding more replacements now that I'm telling everybody my trick, but uh, you'll find them much more economically uh, used on uh, eBay and other, other used uh, equipment sources. So that will get you through the field. Uh, once you start to bring samples in and want to look at some quality data and kind of what you've harvested, um, the first thing to, we automated uh, is the scales, all the balances. And so you can get some balances uh, that are appropriate for fruits, vegetables, you know, everything short of a crate of them, so up to easily um, six kilograms. Um, six hundred dollars with the usb input um, many of your older scales might have this rs232 it kind of looks like a vga connector like you might connect you know, your computer to a projector with um, a similar style uh, many new scales have the usb adapter option um, but many people uh, aren't really utilizing it and so here's one of our scales something we already had in the lab um, that it turned out we could just buy this red box here this usb interface for a hundred dollars that plugs in and now lets the scale you just simply hit the print button on the scale and it tra transmits it right into the spreadsheet on the computer uh, so it's really efficient really accurate and fast um, Bluetooth adapters and are now available for either so to go wireless is an option and you can convert probably your older scale which probably does have this output um, into a digitally connected scale uh, one of the downsides um, as we've gone through this is still there's sometimes some software um, that can uh, uh, translate what's coming in from the scale into uh, uh, text and 
numbers, just like it was coming in from the keyboard. Uh, so you see this keyboard wedge software. Um, there's some freebies and some that you can you can purchase, but uh, that's something where we're still looking for some better solutions than the one we're using. <clears throat> Other um, uh, input and measurement, um, uh, the barcode ruler uh, that's in your handout section, you can print it out. When you do print it out, you're going to want to make sure um, that you don't have any scaling options uh, open on your printer uh, and uh, make sure it's coming out 100% scale, double check it with a real ruler. Um, but what you'll see is it's a stacked barcode. Um, and so all along there's these half centimeter gradations, the best you can get um, uh, from a, uh, a your typical 1D laser scanner, this red line here, is about two and a half millimeters. That's the resolution. Uh, but there is is something fundamentally uh, strange has been pointed out to me of my scale that used quarter centimeters. That wasn't what the metric system was for. Uh, they pointed out. <clears throat> but so this is by the nearest 0.5 uh, centimeters. And how it works is the object you want to measure is this orange. Uh, uh, fruit here uh, is simply uh, lining it up with the zero line. We have a, a wooden backstop here. And then as you scan down with the barcode scanner, it will scan until you can find the first barcode horizontally that it can read. Uh, it'll chirp and that will go into the system. And that's how you've measured this sample. So there's half centimeter. And then to get can simply rotate it 90 degrees and do another pass down at the barcode scanner. Um, and that is a, uh, a really quick way to get some of this measurement data in. Uh, samples that don't work for that, uh, or you need some internal measurements, maybe the, the pericarp thickness on a bell pepper. Uh, we have some USB calipers we'll show in the upcoming webinars um, that really let you get some of that dimensional data much more precisely and uh, to a finer scale. Um, also, as we get to the quality data, the scales do everything for the dry matter. Uh, here is a Brix refractometer um, that is now available with Bluetooth. So now our entire system is free of keyboards where you're scanning in the sample with a barcode uh, and generating more barcodes as we bring it in. And each one of those is traveling with each sample of the, the fruit or plant as we do all these different measurements. And that's key is as we use some VLOOKUP functions in Excel to bring that all together. Everything is has the same name. Uh, there's no typos in it, no people using some different formatting options. So it all is automatically compiled uh, into one sheet. Um, the other uh, thing, and we'll focus on it in the, the field and uh, lab portions, webinars, see webinars two and three for more detail. Um, as we've done more with digital cameras and figuring out how we want to use digital images, one of the things that we we find uh, we are doing quite a bit of is teaching uh, photography, some basics uh, to some of the uh, people we bring on to help us out during harvest time. Uh, so there are some quick fixes that we are using uh, for that's uh, available in many cameras looking at exposure and color balance. Um, and some of these can be translated to um, your iPhone or other devices. One of the things we have is an 18% gray background, so just kind of a medium gray. This is what phone, uh, cameras detect and are designed around knowing as a neutral color. Uh, and so as you've tried black bat backdrops and found your image all washed out as your uh, camera is trying to automatically compensate to what it thinks is night, uh, or a white backdrop and there's so much light coming into the camera and then you end up with uh, a black blob where um, your fruit or vegetable was having a gray background and taking the exposure off the background and there's some ways to set it up so we have a stationary camera that is just set up um, so that it can uh, be taking these images at that neutral setting and we'll be going through the the detail um, is where some places will focus in upcoming webinars um, the other thing we have for the field 
world, and one of the things you can uh, take home uh, now is uh, I see Emily here in the field uh, taking some overhead uh, photos of some of the, uh, our, uh, some plants in the field. Um, before uh, drones uh, were common uh, and still a much more uh, economical alternative without the need to be registered as a pilot. Um, here we've simply mounted a camera to uh, a, wind, a window washer pole for a second, uh, third story windows. It's very lightweight aluminum pole we picked up at the hardware store for $35. And this is going to let you get 20 to 20 five feet in the air over your crop. Uh, for many of the images you may be taking, uh, except for field scale images, um, the, the documentation, this is uh, definitely all the height you might need. To make it into a camera mount, uh, camera mounts, uh, they just simply use a quarter 20 bolt. So while you are at the same hardware store, you just buy a, a quarter inch bolt with a, a 20 threads per inch, the most common they'll have there in the bin. Um, you can screw that right through the top of the window washer pole into the tripod mount of your camera and it's up there and many new cameras uh, have a wi-fi uh, uh, setting an option so wi-fi enabled cameras will allow you to see the photo that's being taken on your phone um, It'll be the, the shutter release for you um, <clears throat> and allow you to do some changes in focus, et cetera, just walking through the field. And so this is a very convenient way uh, to be able to take some of those overhead photos. Um, so some examples of what we're doing before that, uh, when we were still in our step ladder days, which is a much more aerobic uh, activity to get Get these pictures. <clears throat> um, this, uh, these are some overhead photos of some cucumber plots um, that we had taken as we were trying to quantify and describe the difference in damage we saw uh, as a result of downy mildew. And you can see some of the uh, resistant, uh, like this plot 09205, market more than 97, versus a susceptible uh, down here. Um, are things that you can really easily document this way to share uh, some of the photos without getting other plants that you might catch horizontally uh, in the view of just using this system. Um, and uh, also one thing we find is really useful is we'll often set this up in video mode, walk through the field with this overhead camera, and then as we want to look at some of the different observations we made uh, throughout the year uh, as we're in the winter after the plants are gone, we have that kind of live uh, recording of the walkthrough uh, where we can refer back and double check and if there are any measurements that seem out of line, we have that as a resource. This has been extremely valuable to us as having these uh, plot photos taken this way. Um, so uh, I think, as you can tell, we are uh, very glad we have this system and we have made the transition from uh, note cards and clipboards and writing the data down uh, to having this digital system where we are really just have everything coming in through a scanned barcode, a USB or Bluetooth um, signal uh, right into a spreadsheet. Um, <clears throat> some of the challenges as I kind of started to lay out are are some of the, the startup costs associated with this. Uh, and to get going in with a system you might really like um, does have some non-trivial expenses. Planning ahead uh, and knowing what are some of these routine uh, observations you're probably going to need to make for the crop if you've been working with it for a while. I'm I'm sure you know all those responses and what you're rating, um, but having those as scannable barcodes to go into the field works with the PDA. It does have a, a BlackBerry style keyboard you can use and a number input and an on-screen touch screen, but still nothing's as fast as just scanning the barcode um, and almost as fast as you can walk through the field, you're entering all this data. Um, one of the, the biggest challenges um, that we've encountered um, is a little bit more uh, psychological um, and it is relating to something with uh, the plant breeder or people working uh, in the field and it's a shift in how you're interacting with the data. Um, one of them uh, is a bit more technical logistical um, and so as you're going through the field you're collecting a few columns instead of just filling in this data 
data sheet where you get to see all of uh, the different cells uh, that you need to fill in over the course of the season um, and you're kind of creating this one complete grid of representing everything you saw um, and there are people that that is an important uh, process too and they can see the whole picture that way here you're collecting columns you're going through the field and you're collecting one or a couple observations for everything and then you're going to add it together with another similar list of measurements um, there's also uh, making the swap um, and uh, established programs where you have this written tradition you don't want to make the change quickly um, and so there are a lot of folks that um, are either you know apprehensive and want to see it working first um, there are people that they just really enjoy taking their clipboard out to the field and that is um, you know, an important element of their job uh, to them so figuring out how to make that transition something where they're going to uh, go along with the change uh, is important um, and just thinking about you know some of the how we interact in the pen to paper aspects um, finding other ways to to have that um, is uh, often important we found in getting some of the the buy-in uh, from the, the people that have been working with us for a long time and doing an great job uh, kind of changing to a different system. <clears throat> so that was uh, an overview of the program that we put together and some of the components. Um, that's the general view in the upcoming webinars, like we mentioned, will be much more technical. So September 7th, uh, some of the labels and how we use them and what we buy and how we use it and which model is working for us. Uh, so really all the how-to, September 7th, um, the, the field observations uh, and how we set up that overhead camera and kind of how to use some of the functions uh, to have great results will be the next one. So all your field observations. And then part three is going to be really looking at uh, the setup we have for all the, the morphometric data, post-harvest quality data, and then how we take the harvest photos in our photo booth, how you can recreate that so you can have foolproof good color and focus uh, on all the you know, mug shots of all the vegetables you might be bringing in. And then the last key thing is how to do some simple uh, scripts to uh, within the spreadsheet itself to be able to compile all the data and pull it together. Um, and so with that, so to some thank yous for the P Lindsay, Sarah, Emily that helped us pioneer a lot of this. Uh, the Buckler Group at Cornell uh, that really led the way with these systems in maize and we've adapted them uh, to our vegetables. Uh, Alice for ho hosting us today and to the USDA NEFA uh, AFRI program for providing the, the funding for us to be unmuted. Uh, be able to put this together for you today. So uh, thank you uh, for joining us and I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, we do have some questions in our queue right now. And so I'm going to move on to our questions here. Um, we had one comment here and this person said that um, he found that 2D barcodes are more robust for them in the sense that they're less susceptible to minor imperfections in printing. So, for example, if your printer has a small dot out on the print head, it could easily render a 1D barcode useless without you noticing until it's too late. So it may also depend on the printer. Do you have comments on that? Um, yeah, no, and we just uh, uh, dealt with that. So we had to replace a print head on a printer. Um, you know, it's definitely something we check, uh, and it's something where people were printing out uh, everything and they were kind of ready to take it to the field and you know they, it looks good but you know they, they didn't scan so we do check them um, as they come out of the machine there is some um, a little there is the opportunity for something to go wrong if it's uh, coming out along one of those black lines um, that can happen uh, our challenge in the field was mud splashes damage um, moving vines around um, row covered so there'd be things that would rub and what uh, for printing um, the comment is 
exactly right. Um, but for uh, birds perching on your stakes, etc., in the field, uh, mud splashing for us, um, those were issues with the 2D barcodes. But for the printer, it's a spot on comment. That's true. Um, how often does a code fail to scan and what do you do when that happens? Yeah. Um, when a code fails to scan, um, the the easy thing we do about that is there's also the human readable uh, portion below. It's a habit you don't want to get into, but below each of those barcodes, uh, I show the 1D, 2D, uh, like the word hello was right below. Um, so that was actually the human readable version of what was there. And so it's letting you know what you're printing out is what you intend uh, to be. So you have the translation right there and you can always use that as a back up and kind of type it in um, our barcodes you know if there's a problem with the printer like the previous person mentioned we had something so one in uh, 20 uh, and it wasn't working and that was a problem um, but usually um, it's 99.9% .9 now we're kind of surprised uh, when we have one that doesn't scan um, and we have gone through um, some different scanners we limit the amount of text so what we're printing is kind of nice big chunky bold barcodes and that really helps let all the other information be uh, something we might have so the pedigrees when so trying to put that on the barcode we just have all the plot numbers and we'll bring with us on the tablet or Dropbox or print it elsewhere on the stake all the other information it doesn't have to be encoded in the barcode to be really accessible to you Okay. Um, do you have a kind of software for setting up plot images in a contact sheet like you just showed? Um, no, the the ones we have, there's not an automated one. That would be one of the, the great things that right now we lack. Um, we'll just use some uh, some of the default settings on, you know, some of the image viewers on, on the their, yeah, the standard image viewer uh, software to do that. But that would be great. Um, the other things that we're working on um, is things to be able to pull up and kind of go through and compile some of the uh, information uh, across years. I think there are some good systems uh, coming along that are really looking at plant breeding data. Uh, those are going to be great. I think you can look at this as the front end to that, the different ways to get the information that you're going to put into some plant breeding information system. This is the, the data acquisition side. Okay, um, so this is a question for when you were talking about how you take your photographs. I know you'll be covering that more in the September 28th webinar, but um, this person wanted to know if um, it was 18% reflectance gray background that you said? Yeah, an 18% gray. Um, you uh, will go over in some upcoming webinars that you can find this at a photography store and art and place where you have a gray card. And so you can buy things that are exactly that percent gray. Um, the short answer is you take a snapshot uh, of, of that image and it will give you your f-stop and uh, aperture and then you just uh, go into manual mode and enter those settings in um, and you've programmed the camera for that uh, exposure uh, in your light settings and then you're good to go. Okay we have a couple people wondering more or less the same thing um, about whether mm -hmm. or not and you could use your phone or tablet camera um, or just a smartphone instead of a uh, PDA. So are there certain apps that might allow you to do that as a, use that as a scanner instead of buying a new piece of hardware? Um, yes, yep. And so um, uh, there are some uh, Bluetooth scanners that work uh, uh, really well. Uh, we have these uh, also. Um, and so you can get a, a Bluetooth scanner, um, and the barcode equipment websites, you'll find many examples. Um, and if you have uh, with some of the improved versions of some of the spreadsheet apps. Um, now Office 365 um, is letting us uh, have the, a, a quite fully functional version of uh, Microsoft Excel out in the field. That is very handy for this. One of the challenges uh, that was with uh, some of the iPad tablets uh, was 
that the scanner would disable the on-screen keyboard. And if you did need to, um, some of the different manipulations, if you made an error and just wanted that backspace key, um, that was really hard to access. Um, but with the, the advent of especially some of the waterproof cases for many tablets, um, that works. I think it's a matter of um, you know how much you're taking to the field. Do you need a free hand? Um, um, but yes, uh, a cordless Bluetooth scanner, even corded, can work very well in a, a tablet or phone. Um, we just, uh, for a variety of reasons, just having that dedicated uh, business-only device in the field um, is really handy, and buying them used, it's almost the same price as the scanner. Okay. Um, could you please give some examples of software to generate labels and stacks with barcodes? Yeah, yep. Um, so if you want the stacked barcode, uh, like I provided in the, the ruler, uh, if you want to print one that's going to measure meters in the air instead of centimeters, um, we used one uh, called um, a barcode generator. Um, we can pro we'll provide some links to that in upcoming uh, uh, webinars, and that one is there's a button you press for the stacked barcode function. It prints them all out uh, to get that barcode that we provided. We did do a lot of work to make sure it was the the size of it and scaling it where we did some work in uh, uh, some uh, layout software to stretch it to exactly the right size and print it out. Um, the software, um, and there's a variety, so not to recommend any uh, in particular, but to list some of the options. Uh, Tagit Pro uh, is one of the uh, pieces of software that's available. Uh, Bartender, you saw uh, an image from a bar the Bartender file. We use Bartender Pro because it will you know, suck in data off the of spreadsheets. Um, and there's a variety. Uh, a key way to start finding much of this is uh, if you look at uh, horticultural printers, as you Google that, or horticultural labels, that is the, the key phrase to help you find all of this as you do searches. You'll go right. Um, the other thing is you can download a font, uh, the Code 39 I mentioned. So Code 39 is a true type font you can download. And so you can just kind of copy, paste in Excel, make everything that font, and you have the barcodes. The only challenge then is how do you get all those barcodes conveniently onto all those uh, stakes or labels? And that's where some of that layout software is very convenient for us. But there's people that are really good um, at some of the, the mailing list functions uh, in the, the software are using. That could work well enough if you were just getting started. OK. Um, how do you go about managing battery life for digital devices while you're in the field? I can imagine running into a degree of range anxiety with battery life with certain devices. Yes, um, then that was, you know, that, then that'll be one of the things that really hurts your ability to convince people you have this great new system. If partway through the battery dies, you have to go recharge um, and they'll just pull out pen and paper and show you like <laughs> how much quicker they are. Uh, we all have this John Henry complex. It's, it's fine. It pushes the, the technology to be honest and true. Um, so that's one of the things about that, the PDA we had. So since you can't be doing other things, there's not really any temptation to be using other things that take up the battery life. It has a hot swappable battery on the back. Um, and otherwise, now... Uh, if you're using a tablet, smartphone, um, there are the battery extender packs for many of these. Um, and uh, there's also some USB battery packs um, that you can get some rechargeable battery packs that you can just plug it in and be charging your device uh, in the field. Um, the main thing that we've run into is some of the the phones and tablets. Um, as you're holding that, they're in the field. The sun is shining down on the screen. Um, there is a tendency for that to overheat. Uh, we found where the the more dedicated PDAs don't do that. Um, the other 
thing about the PDA or if you go the tablet smartphone route, no matter which device you get, there is an option, it might be through an add-on, to have a little SD or micro SD card. We're always saving the data to that because if the device gets rained on, dropped, forgotten, left out in the field, run over by a tractor, we've done it all. Um, and so you might lose the device, but all your data is on the removable chip. Um, and so the some of the PDAs, it's hard to get to the little micro SD card was buried inside and really well protected for all sorts of agricultural disasters. So you can still recover your data. Uh, we're also uh, plugging them in every day and uploading everything uh, as a backup uh, online. That's a key thing to do. Uh, if you have uh, your cell data in the field, maybe you're adding things uh, to Google Drive or something. Um, as you're going and maybe you're just, everything is being automatically uploaded. Um, we we don't have the luxury of that for all our devices in the field yet. Okay, um, yeah, somebody did ask about whether you have issues with reading a barcode with a reader during outs, um, things like sunlight. Um, does sunlight affect the ability of the barcode reader to? Uh, we, yeah, we haven't had uh, that issue uh, except for we, uh, had a malfunctioning uh, unit. Um, you know, we keep in mind we're 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 in Ithaca, not uh, someplace much sunny and more tropical, uh, where the sunlight is a little bit more intense. Um, so we've had good durability through the season with everything. We'll show some things lasting multiple years, um, but we haven't had that. Um, the challenges we have had is with the 1D uh, getting it lined up well. Some people uh, don't. Um, it doesn't come too quickly how to get that lined up and scanned. Um, and uh, if you have uh, trouble, if, if you're red, green, colorblind, uh, the lasers for many of these, you'll see them as red light. Um, and it, it can be a challenge to know how to position it if you can't see that positioning uh, cue that's built in. Um, that was, those are two of the, the challenges we've had Otherwise, it works well, and the screens have worked, and the hot swappable batteries and having the extended battery packs um, provided everything for us. But those are certainly uh, initial criticisms we had from the crew and things I had to overcome to get them to happily use the devices and switch from the, the note cards. OK. Um, what brand of PDA do you use, and how heavy is it? Um, and do you use it in the field for? hours every day? Or? Yeah, we might uh, use it for a couple hours. There's a, a range of PDAs in it, the water uh, resistant, rugged, droppable mill spec ones are ones that we go to. Um, there's a variety that's available, so not to recommend any particular, but the one we're currently using is it's a Motorola uh, MC55AO um, is the whole number. Uh, and I think uh, Zebra might uh, uh, be uh, the manufacturer now. That there's many options. And you'll see, uh, you'll have an options for if you want the extended battery, if you want a number keypad, a QWERTY keypad, just a couple of chunky arrows. Um, um, you'll the type of scanner if you want a camera on it. There's many options, um, so you still have to look within that. And there's quite there's quite a lot of other brands that also make uh, really good devices. Um, That's just one that we've hit on um, as they were common and. Uh, available cheaply on eBay. <laughs> okay, um, we have various comments from the audience of recommendations of various types of software here, so I'm just going to read those okay. out. Um, one person uses RS Key as a free wedge software, and Great. then another person highly recommends an Android app developed by the Kansas State University Wheat Genomics Program called Fieldbook. This app yes. allows you to customize your own data entry form for collecting phenotypic traits. And um, let's see. Um, yep, then I'm familiar an, with that. That can work really well okay. uh, for some systems, definitely. Yeah, it's a good okay. one. Okay. And then we've got the same the same person. Bartender and Nice Label are also very good barcode label design 
softwares. Mm -hmm. Yep, and we're using Bartender, we agree, yep. Oh, good, okay, and then someone, okay, he says, if you use an iPad, he recommends checking out a project product from Hood, Hoodie Vision. It is an attachable shade to make viewing possible in direct sunlight and also prevents overheating from sun exposure. Huh, okay. Yep. Let's see if anybody else yeah. has any more. And with uh, an Apple product, um, I don't know in the most recent releases if it's still... Uh, sorry, but there were some barcode readers with an on-off switch on the side, uh, so you could quickly toggle between a Bluetooth device and the on-screen um, with some of the new Bluetooth features. I don't know if that's still necessary, but it, um, a couple years ago it was a limitation for us. Okay, um, here's a good question. How is it how easy is it to avoid confusion when taking the barcodes from the printer to the correct location in the field? Uh, yes, um, so uh, we'll go over that in number two. And so we have some systems uh, that uh, approaches to it that are really critical. So one way that really helps you is, you know, they all have the human readable portion. I don't know if uh, I can scroll up quickly just to show you that portion. Um, well, here, this is shows you kind of the stake readout and everything. Um, so you can see um, this barcode, uh, what it says is 17450, um, and that's something that the translation, the software automatically provides as a human readable version right below. So that is, um, you, you wouldn't be more confused than you would. Um, there'd be the same error rate as if you were uh, putting just the written stakes out because you do have, it's just pre-printed and you have the ability to capture um, that information automatically. And see, if to, to help that, we often have the much larger one and this would be uh, rotated vertically in the field. So this would be a big number on the side. Um, and we do think, so this is what, this would be the same stake that goes uh, in the transplant tray and then that goes in the field will be an identical one. We often kind of bundle them together. And as they're taking the transplanter through the field, uh, the person that's usually putting the plot stakes is calling out the number and the person that's pulling the plugs answers them. Uh, and we just confirm each one as we go through as we have many plots um, that keeps everybody talking and that human side is avoiding the errors. But otherwise, this is the human readable translation they print out together. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. How many, do you have any suggestions to characterize the root traits? Uh, root traits. Um, I guess the um, there are uh, entire uh, groups that you know, their specialty is how to image and characterize them. Um, and 3D great imaging, that's going to be beyond what we do. That's you know, great specialists in those areas. Um, <clears throat> but if you are having observations um, uh, for them, uh, and if you have some stock responses you use to describe them, uh, you know that's something you could make into the barcode and scan it to enter it. Um, if your um, many groups are still looking at the dry mass um, of the roots, um, uh, so as you dig it out, you can be putting it on a scale uh, um, that has. You know, the digital input. Um, so those are some of the, the basic ways if you're describing the architecture. But um, I am aware if you want the more in, uh, intense version, there are people that are developing, uh, so at the recent NAPB meeting, some great substrates to grow roots in that are much more soil-like. Um, and there's a variety of groups that have some great 3D imaging rotating programs uh, to do this. Um, that is, they're, they're definitely specialists in the area. Um, I'm approaching this as a plant breeder that just needed something to work for me. Okay. Um, is there any way of sending the data to a server in real time as it's being collected to avoid loss of data due to disasters like rain? Yeah. Um, yep. So uh, if you are within Wi-Fi range or, you know, have cell data, um, then that is, you know, something where um, 
whatever data cloud backup you might use for your computer, you can. So perhaps you have the Dropbox uh, app uh, downloaded on your smartphone. Uh, maybe you're in uh, Google Sheets and then you're actually, you know, you're entering that data online. Um, uh, so that can be a great way to go. If you have that, you'll lose a little functionality and there'll be a little bit more um, if you have a, a few, if you're bringing a few people on and training them, there's always that uh, kind of a little bit more of a learning curve. There's more things for Murphy's Law to have happen. Um, but so that's why we're usually just setting up all the devices to automatically save to that storage card. Um, so most things that can happen that are disastrous, you can you can still just pop out that SD card and be fine. Um, and you wanna you know, be uploading, checking quality uh, daily. The, hopefully the worst you lose is um, one person, what they did for a day that can be recaptured. So by checking every day, you can see. Okay, we have um, two comments from different people about label colors. Um, one yeah. person says, as far as barcode readability, um, he recommends avoiding dark colored labels like red or dark blue because it doesn't provide enough contrast from the black print to make it very readable. And then the yes. other person says pretty much the same thing. We've noticed that different colors don't read as well in the field. White, yellow, and pink seems to scan better than blue or darker colors. Yeah, uh, I think we um, we have used exclusively uh, the white ones. Um, you know, there's a variety you can get, and we'll be looking at some of the the tags you can get that uh, conveniently loop around, like some of the 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 plastic track trash tags that are kind of like a zip tie that you can print barcodes on those too. They're very handy. We're using exclusively the white labels um, and we have the, the white pot stakes uh, or white kind of sticker adhesive labels um, for those reasons. Yep. Okay. Um, do you have experience with words barcoding and print options? And if so, how does it compare to other label making software? Um, I'm not familiar with that one. We we tried a, a couple and went with one that some of our colleagues uh, were using. Um, um, so I haven't. There's uh, a few others I I saw last night that were new on uh, one of the horticultural supplies um, uh, places. I think. When one of the things, uh, advice where uh, people have tried things, uh, including me, that have not worked out as well, is they have very thin pot stakes, um, pot labels, and they'll say the plastic is so thin, and they'll, um, uh, while it's advertised that those will go through uh, many types of printers, you, we really found it works best if you get a. Um, a specialized printer uh, for those stakes uh, that can handle the wider media. And as you might see, a cheaper version of the horticultural printer online, it, it hasn't been customized except thicker media, and it will work well for a little while until you kind of burn it out from uh, taking the very thick uh, stakes and putting them through something a piece of paper is supposed to go through. Um, so that's one of the 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 major challenges we had in trying to work around but um the our stake printer um we're not sure if we will keep it as we've found labels and um <clears throat> some nice tall 32 inch high uh stakes that we can just stick the label to that it's up above the plant it's something you don't have to bend over to scan it's really convenient and looks like it's going to be a lot cheaper Okay, we have one more question here. Um, can you go over the scale uh, for the weighing of samples? We have a dusty area that we're weighing dry matter prior to fine grinding. Do you have experience with this type of situation? Um, yes, um, uh, our we're scanning all this um, in uh, some garage bays and workrooms that we share with uh, the tractors and forklifts and uh, beets coming out of the the field, right? So yeah, dirt everywhere. Um, so we are uh, uh, using some lab balances, you know, not the analytical ones, but you'll find the portable battery operated, or you know, some of the ones that cost a couple hundred dollars have a you know a a, a, a good reputation, uh, the brand, um, and um, <clears throat> 
they they are working just fine. Uh, we have the the challenges we have is not the dust because many of these are designed so you can spill and they'll get quite dirty and nothing goes inside it sheds it. It's like kind of shingled and how it's built. Um, those are all working fine for us. The the problems we find is in the transportation is when uh, someone uh, takes the scale and is rough with it um, as they bring it out to from field location to field location. <clears throat> we'll set it up on a table under an easy up on the battery and it'll work fine. But if you drop it, toss it. Uh, there's a variety of ways that you can damage the the scale. Otherwise, it works great. Um, uh, the and some of the very durable scales. Um, you know, they'll they'll be older ones with the RS two thirty two. Looks like a VGA cable. Um, look for the RS two thirty two to Bluetooth adapter online, so you can buy them that will take your old workhorse scale and make it a Bluetooth scale. And so there's just a button on it that would uh, usually it's print. Um, and so when it's hooked up digitally, that print uh, is actually just transfers the reading. Uh, right into your spreadsheet for you. And what kind of field stakes do you use? Um, this person has a hard time finding a supplier of field stakes that you can attach a printed label to. Yeah, um, and um, we'll we'll show that in some in more detail in the webinar too. Um, the we have the uh, twelve inch and a long eighth inch stick uh, eight inch eight inch eighth inch thick um, uh, wooden labels. We usually get the orange ones so they show up. Uh, we use a, a stapler uh, just to staple um, the pot stakes onto those. Um, that worked really well um, and it works really well in the beginning of the season until the plants really start to grow. Um, they will rot or the, the course of the season uh, get shorter, fall off, get hit by tractors. Uh, we like the shorter ones because you can get you can drive tractors over them still, um, but what we have now <clears throat> are some metal ones um, that it's a couple metal wires like a little ladder that you stick in the ground, um, and there's a, some corrugated plastic that slides on the top. It's like you might see um, the same. Uh, sign someone might have in their yard for uh, the different can vote for me uh, candidate signs or um, di different apartment rental signs. Uh, and so there's a, a 32 inch tall one with uh, like a three by <clears throat> two little placard on the top. They're quite cheap and they stick way up and uh, we can just put the stickers right on uh, and it will last for two to three years of reuse. Um, the sticker will last <clears throat> that long and the, the, the plastic itself eventually breaks down in the sunlight. So we, we're replacing them now after the, the third year. Uh, we, were, uh, uh, we got them from the switchgrass program here at Cornell. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. So um, I hope you can join us for our next webinars in this series on September 7th and September 28th. So thank you so much for Mike, Michael um, for this presentation and thanks to everyone for joining us.